Victory Through Christ By Ernest Barker The word victory is one of the grandest words in our language. Surely every Christian desires to live a victorious life to be not only conquerors, but more than conquerors. If this is to be our continual experience we must first of all be willing to acknowledge defeat. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18. It is frequently said that there is a certain amount of goodness in every one of us, but this idea is quite contrary to the clear teaching of the Scriptures. Paul was one of the greatest saints in the history of the church, and yet to the end of his earthly life he designated himself the chief of sinners. Apart from the grace of God we are altogether bad. We may endeavor to reform our lives, we may resort to various forms of religious or mental patchwork, seeking thereby to make ourselves more presentable to God, but a careful examination of Romans, chapter 7, will reveal how utterly sinful we are in ourselves, even as Christians. In this particular chapter, the unpleasant word sin occurs 14 times. The writer mentions also more than once the commandment which I understand to imply the Ten Commandments, seeing that the Lord Jesus said that the first and great commandment in the law is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This suggests that all the commandments are gathered up into one tremendous human responsibility, namely, that we love God with our entire being which is the chief reason why we were created. But who has attained to this perfect standard? The answer is, not one single member of the human race who has lived in the past or who is living today with the exception of our Lord Jesus Christ. The unpleasant truth is that we have all failed, and failed completely. This teaching is by no means popular, but it is far better to face the facts of Scripture than to live in a fool's paradise. The Apostle realized his complete inability to attain to the divine standard to so great an extent, so he exclaimed in the bitterness of his soul, O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from this body of death? This body in which sin dwells, and which is capable of every evil thing. Some friend may say, in view of what you have said, is victory at all possible? The answer is a glorious yes. The condition is quite clear, namely, a complete transfer from self-confidence to Christ-confidence. This was the inevitable conclusion at which Paul arrived when he said triumphantly in the closing verse of Romans 7, I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Herein lies the secret of a victorious life and adequate appreciation of the person and work of Christ. Upon this depends every advancement in the Christian life. Let us investigate this theme a little further. What the law failed to do, God has accomplished. The law failed to give life, it could not reveal God to us as a loving and understanding Father. But all this has been made possible by God's giving His Son to be the Savior of all who believe in Him. When Christ died on the shameful cross, He not only dealt with our sins from the viewpoint of forgiveness, but He dealt with them so thoroughly that they were carried away into the land of eternal forgetfulness, according to Hebrews 8 verse 12, Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. When God forgives, he forgets. The Christian can now exult in the truth of the opening words of Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The judgment which was due to us was borne by him who became our surety. There is therefore nothing to fear. Our condemnation is now a matter of history, our present is amply provided for, our future is assured. In 1833 the British government passed the Slavery Emancipation Act. From January 1, 1830 for the keeping of slaves within the British Empire was forbidden. We may easily imagine how eagerly those downtrodden people anticipated the arrival of midnight 1833. When the clock struck twelve, thousands of them rushed into the various churches, chapels, and halls, shouting and praising God for their liberty. This cost the old country twenty million pounds, one of the finest transactions ever completed. This is a faint illustration of what took place at Calvary. The Lord Jesus paid our debt, he the just one suffered for us the unjust ones, he bore the penalty of our sins, and now we are free. How true and suggestive are the words in Proverbs 17 verse 8, A gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it, whithersoever it turneth it prospereth. This is a beautiful picture of our lovely Lord. From whatever angle we view him we see nothing less than perfection. The following verse of a hymn states this very clearly. 
because the sinless Savior died. My sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. This is the victory which Christ won for us on the cross. O glorious Savior! How can those who hear of thee refrain from placing their confidence in thee? The question now arises, how is this victory to be consolidated in our everyday life? Let me suggest a few items which set forth what Christ is to us individually and corporately, at the same time not forgetting that reality is one thing and realization is another. He is our complete satisfaction. In our Lord's disputation with the Jews, recorded in John chapter 6, he affirmed that he was the living bread which came down from heaven, which he would give for the life of the world. He followed this by telling his hearers that it was necessary to eat his flesh and to drink his blood if they were to enjoy eternal life. Apparently, this teaching was too exacting for those who were listening. The result was from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Those disciples were merely nominal followers. The Lord Jesus then turned to the twelve, his real disciples, and said plaintively, Will ye also go away? Simon Peter at once said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Here we see Peter at his best. He said in other words, Lord, if thou canst not satisfy us, no one can. This reminds us of the psalmist's magnificent confession in Psalm 73 verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee, and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee? Complete satisfaction is found only in Christ. To rejoice in these outstanding implications is Victory He is our greatest treasure. The believers to whom the Apostle Peter wrote his two epistles had never seen Christ physically. For his name's sake they had been driven by persecution into various parts of Asia Minor, which accounts for the various passages where the writer refers to their trial of faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. It was indeed a fiery trial, cch 118 and 412. But notwithstanding their sufferings, they loved their Lord, and their love was real. This reminds us of our Lord's words to Thomas, Because thou hast seen me thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed, John 20 verse 29. This is where we come in. However wonderful it was for Thomas to have seen his Lord face to face in that upper room, there is something more wonderful, namely, for those of us who have never seen him, and yet have believed in him. How lovely it would have been to have been present when the Lord of glory trod the streets and lanes of Palestine, to have seen him, and to have heard him. But we shall see him in a coming day, when faith shall give place to sight, and hope shall burst into reality. The knowledge of this glorious anticipation signifies victory. He is our unsearchable fullness. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, Colossians 1 verse 19. Christ now lives in the power of an endless life. Being ascended and glorified, there resides in him all fullness for his people. Every blessing, every joy, every encouragement is located in our risen Lord. In Colossians 2 verse 19 the Apostle writes, In him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is one of the most profound passages in the Pauline epistles. Wisdom, personality, authority, character, sovereignty, and every other divine attribute reside in the risen Christ. Apart from Him we possess nothing that is abiding, but in Him we possess every blessing God can bestow. This means that God can have nothing to do with us apart from Christ. After reminding us that in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the writer adds, and ye are complete in Him. This is beyond comprehension. To realize that we who are altogether unfitted, undeserving, and unworthy are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power is to be lost in wonder, love, and praise. In Ephesians 3 verse 19 the Apostle prays that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. This is well nigh breathtaking. But is this at all possible? If it is, how can it be experienced? It may help us if we bear in mind that the word fullness occurs in each of the verses we have quoted. Christ is God's fullness. Therefore to be filled with all the fullness of God is to be filled with Christ. This involves the negation of self. There is no room for the coexistence of Christ and self in the same compartment. We may learn from this that Christ exalting, self-abasing, this is victory. 
He is our indissoluble life. One of the many reasons why Christ came into the world was that we might have life, and that we might have it more abundantly, John 10 verse 10. This does not relate to the transitory life we live on this planet. It is the life which can never be interrupted, the life of God which has been transmitted by the operation of the Holy Spirit to every genuine believer in the Son of God. We have life through the death of Christ, we have more abundant life through His resurrection. Every Christian has life, but not every Christian has life more abundantly. When John Knox, the Scottish reformer, lay dying he said to his wife, Read to me the words where I cast my first anchor. His wife turned to John 17 verse 3, and read, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The dying man said, Thank you, wife, that is where I cast my first anchor. What a magnificent anchorage for the soul, sure, steadfast, and abiding. One of the greatest statements our Lord made pertaining to this theme is recorded in John 10 verse 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, in no wise perish forever. Only the Lord Jesus Christ could have made such a declaration. He also affirmed that no one was able to pluck or snatch them out of his hand. Those lovely hands hold the believer more tenaciously than the nails held his hands on the cross. The Savior then refers to the Father, and says, No man is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, thus reinforcing our security. We do well to remember that when we trusted the Savior, He undertook the responsibility of taking us to heaven, just as the Good Shepherd in Luke 15 carried the helpless sheep home, because it could not reach its home by its own efforts. Another purpose for which Christ died was that He might deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There is therefore no such thing as death for the believer in Christ. What the world, and even many believers, call death is really the dissolution of the tabernacle, as James says, the body without the spirit is dead, James 2 verse 26. When the body ceases to function, the occupant, self, is released, and goes immediately to be with Christ which, as Paul says, is very far better. To know, to enjoy, and to live in the power of these wonderful revelations means victory. He is our Sovereign Lord. The Lordship of Christ touches every phase of Christian life and service. When He has complete control, then all is well. When the Jews crucified the Lord of glory, they thought that that would be the end of His teaching, and, to a great extent, His influence. But the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost disposed of this assumption by saying, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 verse 36. The title Lord implies authority and dominion. When Saul of Tarsus was apprehended by Christ on the Damascus Road, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The erstwhile persecutor and blasphemer replied, Who art thou, Lord? He followed that by asking, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Saul had assumed that Christ was dead, but now for the first time in his life he realized he was alive and was actually addressing him by name. Also it was the first occasion he used the title Lord. This spontaneous utterance was prompted by the Holy Spirit, because the Scripture says, No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Subsequent to his conversion Paul ever delighted to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. In Philippians 3 verse 5 he enumerates a number of privileges and advantages which were his by reason of his birth and early training, but these things which were gained to him naturally, he was willing to count loss for Christ. And not only so, but he regarded all other things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus his Lord. Let us never forget that in God's time the Son of His love will be acclaimed Lord of all by the entire creation. Whatever attitude men may adopt, to whatever extent they may oppose the divine will, God will have the last word. All in heaven, all in earth, and all in the underworld shall, either voluntarily or by stern necessity, bow in subjection to God's Christ, and every tongue in the whole wide world shall confess that He is Lord to God's everlasting glory. This will be the consummation of the outstanding victory which the Lord Jesus Christ gained at Calvary. Death is swallowed up in victory, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54. O grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55. Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57. And again they said, Hallelujah.